much indeed. Uh, my name is Pavel Kamatsky, and this presentation has been prepared uh, by my learned colleague, Krista Linden, and yours truly. In fact, Krista and I pulled straws, and my straw was longer, which means I won, and I get to present this paper in front of you. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the EU Data Governance Act. So the EU Data Governance Act was uh, adopted as part of the European Strategy for Data. The European Strategy for Data was launched in late February 2020, literally weeks before lockdowns, uh, and it started with a large a stakeholders consultation that lasted until the end of May, and Clarinary participated in the stakeholder uh, consultation as a result of the consultation as a series of regulations were uh, proposed. Uh, they are technically speaking regulations, although they are called ACT. Uh, this is kind of an ang Anglo-Saxon way of uh, calling a uh, legislative, uh, a piece of legislation. And I think that now that the UK is no longer part of the European Union, the European Union is finally free to use Anglo-Saxon terminology uh, in, um, in uh, the legislative work. So uh, we uh, have a series of acts and one of those acts, actually almost all of these acts are in a certain way relevant for Claren, but only one of them has been adopted so far and that's the Data Governance Act. It was adopted uh, on the 30th of May, and it will enter into application on the 24th of September 2023, in uh, a little bit less than a year uh, from now. Uh, let me remind you, it is technically a regulation, which means that it applies directly in all the European member states. There will be no national transposition. Uh, there will be no national law on uh, these matters. Um, the regulation uh, will, uh, there is one act to rule them all, right? Uh, so the, the regulation will apply in all the EU member states. Uh, common European data spaces that were actually quite widely uh, discussed, if not during the conference, then uh, during coffee breaks uh, are also part of the European strategy for data, by the way. So what's in uh, the, the DGA, the Data Governance Act? Uh, to put it shortly, four things. They are they seem unrelated. They are indeed quite unrelated, but they are all relevant in one way or another uh, to Claire and Eric. The first one is about the reuse of protected data held by public sector bodies. And protected data are data, for example, in copyright or, or personal data. Second thing. There is a supervisory framework for the provision of data intermediation services, and I will develop on this a little bit later. Thirdly, perhaps most interestingly, uh, there is a framework for data altruism organizations. And uh, last but not least, uh, there is um, the establishment of a European Data Innovation Board. So let's start with the reuse of protected data held by public sector bodies. Uh, some of you may remember that we currently have what used to be called the Public Sector Information Directive. After uh, a recent reform, it's now called um, an open, the Open Data Directive. And this directive says that data held by public sector bodies should be made available for reuse. However, data that are in copyright or that are personal data are not concerned uh, by this open data directive. They're outside of the scope of this directive, which in practice means that most of the language data that are either in copyright or contain personal data are not concerned by this uh, formerly PSI uh, and now open uh, data uh, directive. It's a problem. And this problem uh, will at least partially be solved by the Data Governance Act. Because under the Data Governance Act, protected data held by public sector bodies should also be made available uh, for reuse. Uh, 
They can, for example, be made available for use only in uh, anonymized or aggregated or otherwise pretreated form. And the access can be provided, for example, only within a secure processing environment, virtual environment, or um, on premise, on site. Um, where, however, where uh, the public sector body um, estimates that reuse cannot be allowed, uh, they should provide assistance to potential reusers in seeking consent uh, of a data subject or permission of the copyright holder. Each member state shall designate at least one competent body per country, per state, to assist public sector bodies in fulfilling these tasks. For example, providing guidance on um, uh, standards, anonymization, uh, secure processing environments, and uh, other similar uh, related issues. The second thing in the Data Governance Act is the framework for data intermediation services. Um, data intermediation services include intermediation between data holders and data users, including provision of technical means to enable such services, for example, platforms, databases, and infrastructures. Does it sound familiar? Well, yes, it does. This is what uh, Clarence centers do. Um, in order to be able to legally provide uh, data intermediation services, um, the providers of such services shall submit a notification to a competent authority and meet a list of requirements to guarantee their neutrality. For example, they should provide those services via a separate legal entity. Uh, they should promote interoperability via use of uh, uh, commonly recognized standards. They should commit to data security and to data protection, etc. What's perhaps most important from the point of view of Clarence Centers is that data intermediation, providers of data intermediation services cannot use the data uh, provided by the users for their own purposes. Uh, they should be neutral with regards to the data. Uh, why is it so? Well, the idea is to promote, on the one hand, data sovereignty, and on the other, to promote trust in data sharing services. The Commission believes that with uh, trusted, neutral intermediaries, Europeans, companies and individuals will be more eager to share data because they will not fear that their data will be reused for, uh, let me call it fishy purposes or purposes that may, they may not have envisaged when they, uh, when they um, um, uploaded their data to the, uh, to the sharing platform. There is an exception an important one, this requirement of notification and, and um, the corresponding requirements do not apply to not-for-profit entities whose activities consist of se seeking data to collect for objectives of general interest, Clarence Centers, that good, unless, unless they aim to establish commercial relationships between data holders and users. So if a Clarence Center wants to establish commercial relationships uh, between um, data holders and users. Uh, the Clarence Center falls within uh, the, uh, this framework and shall notify a competent authority about the, the, their activities and um, um, fulfill the list of requirements in the Data Government Governance Act. Uh, the list is really quite long and quite detailed. It's, I think at least a page and a half in small print, so I uh, won't uh, discuss it in great detail, but uh, of course, if you're interested, I'll be happy to uh, refer you to the relevant article. Finally, well, not finally, because there is a fourth thing, but the third thing, and what I believe is the most important thing is data altruism. So data altruism is defined as, voluntary sharing of data 
on the basis of consent of the data subject or permission of data holders without seeking or receiving a reward beyond compensation related to the incurred costs for objectives of general interest, for example, for scientific research purposes. Now, the Commission believes, based on the stakeholders' consultation, that individuals and companies want to share data for altruistic purposes, such as research, uh, but they don't do that as much as they could because uh, they don't know how to get about it, get around it, right? How to, I mean, which organization to contact uh, and what to do to donate that data for a general interest uh, purpose, such as scientific research. So in order to uh, meet this need, uh, there will now be uh, registered data altruism organizations. So this, it'll, th there will be a label, a badge, if you will, a logo, uh, registered data altruism organization. And in order to apply for this uh, special status, um, an organization will have to fulfill a list of obligations. Now, such a registered organization will be able then to receive uh, data um, altruism data, so to say, so data uh, um, uh, donated on the basis of data altruism and distributed to the users. Uh, the obligations, once again, there is a long list of obligations, but they can be summed up as follows. Uh, a registered data altruism organization should be transparent. That is, uh, it should keep detailed records uh, concerning the data altruism activities and uh, annually report to uh, competent authorities. Of course, the organization cannot reuse data for other purposes than specified by the data holder. The organization should ensure appropriate level of data security as well as provide tools to obtain necessary consent or authorization from the data holder or to uh, withdraw it. One imagine uh, a, an online or otherwise electronic form on which uh, certain boxes can be ticked and unticked at any time by uh, the donator. There will also be competent authorities um, whose task it will be to uh, monitor and supervise compliance with this framework. Now, we don't really know much. We don't certainly don't know everything uh, about this framework for data altruism. And uh, we don't really know much because the European Commission shall adopt and will adopt in 2023, uh, probably two fundamental documents for this framework. The first one being a rule book for data altruism organizations. And this rule book will specify um, among others, the information that should be given to data subjects before they consent for data altruism. Um, the rulebook should, should specify technical and security requirements um, applying to um, data altruism organizations, uh, a communication roadmap uh, taking a multidisciplinary approach so I imagine a strategy in which data altruism organizations should promote uh, their data that they hold on the basis of data altruism, as well as recommendations for interoperability standards. Now, the second document that the European Commission shall adopt that has not been adopted yet is a European data altruism consent form. So they, the, a form, a consent, by which uh, an individual or an organization can donate uh, the data on the basis of data altruism. A good thing is that there will be one form in the whole European Union, so it will be, um, well, uniformed, uh, pun not intended. Um, and it is also announced that this data altruism consent form uh, should be based on a modular uh, approach that is, it should be highly customizable uh, by the data uh, holder. So the data holder can specify 
the public interest uh, um, um, purposes for which uh, the data are being donated and uh, be very specific about who can use the data for what purpose, uh, for how long, for example, and so on and so forth. I'm guessing because we haven't seen the form yet, but um, it will uh, be based on a modular uh, approach. Finally, uh, a European Data Innovation Board uh, will be created. Uh, and in this European Data Innovation Board, experts from competent authorities, as well as other experts, will sit and discuss. Uh, you might have noticed that there are competent authorities for pretty much everything in the Data uh, Governance Act. There will be an uh, increase in the number of competent authorities. Um, and this European Data Innovation Board uh, will have at least three uh, subgroups. One of those subgroups will be specifically about uh, advice on the application of the Data Governance Act. There will be also a subgroup on technical discussions concerning standardization, portability, and, and interoperability of the data. And there will be a subgroup on stakeholder involvement, including academia, industry, and common European data spaces. Now, Krista and I had the dream. Well, not jointly, but uh, we kind of shared uh, this dream and it is our common dream now. Uh, so in our dream, Claire and Eric is a registered data altruism organization. And as such, it receives and distributes data donated on the basis of data altruism for the purposes of language research, humanities research, social uh, sciences research. Um, Claire and Eric also works with the European Data Innovation Board. Claren centers, however, uh, provide public sector bodies with advice and support on data sharing. Uh, and some of them, those who are interested in carrying out commercial activities, act as uh, registered providers of data intermediation services. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pavel, for your uh, interesting talk. Uh, one question about your dream, um, about the data uh, intermediation services, yes. I believe. Yes. Um, and so, so if I understood you correctly, then you, those organizations cannot use those, this data for themselves. Yes. And would that mean, say, for the uh, Finklering Consortium, where the University of Helsinki and other universities are part of that, if Finklering became uh, such a DIS, that universities could not use the data that is stored in Finklering? Well, no, the service shall be provided via a separate legal person. So okay. a separate legal entity for the service should be uh, established. And this legal entity should be neutral with regards to the data. And then, of course, the university as an external, uh, um, as a third party, in fact, uh, can be the user of, of the data. But that's one of the key requirements to fulfill this neutrality uh, um, requirement, uh, really, um, to provide the service via a separate dedicated uh, legal entity. Okay, so that would mean that the language bank for Finland would turn into a separate legal entity, for example. Or you would um, uh, um, perhaps uh, generate a new legal entity for that purpose, rather than transforming the whole bank of Finland into that entity. Okay, thank you. I think there is a question. On the back. Hi, just to add a dream to this dream. Yes. Clarin Eric could also become a counselor, giving advice others to become 
data altruism organizations. Through its capillarity, would be it would be possible. Um, by all means, yes. Uh, although I am not sure if it is desirable to have very many uh, data altruism organizations uh, working towards one common objective of general interest. Um, one data altruism organization can actually uh, collect and distribute data in throughout the uh, across the European borders and the whole European Union. So perhaps one such organization for the specific purpose of language research, research with language data would be enough. But that's uh, just my uh, hypothesis, Occam's razor. Mm -hmm.